Good afternoon. Welcome to Migration Matters event. Uh, this today's event is a city of sanctuary beyond the pandemic. And I'm being joined by a number of guests who will be, uh, whose faces will be turning up in due course. I'm just waiting for them to arrive on screen uh, before I introduce them. Excellent. Everybody's here, everybody's ready. It's time to move on. Um, a city of sanctuary beyond the pandemic. The premise is that we need a rethink of the asylum system in the UK. Um, as organizations working with asylum seekers, migrants and refugees, those in today's events have always been aware of the inequalities that exist in our society. The pandemic has exposed how deep and debilitating this inequality is for the people that suffer the poverty inflicted by the UK's hostile environment. In Sheffield, we have a well-structured and established support network, which has stepped up and has done what it can for the last couple of months. The discussion will cover what needs to change so things don't return to the status quo and so that people are allowed to live with dignity and choice in our city. Now, we're online today because of the current crisis, the pandemic, and as a result, you will probably see me juggling between pieces of paper and the screen. I'm new to this, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, welcome everybody who's here so far, and hopefully lots of, uh, lots of uh, attendees watching what we're doing. First thing I wanna do is introduce everybody who's on screen. I'm Nigel Slack, I'm what's known as an active citizen, and I will be hosting, chairing, facilitating today's discussion um, with three respected members of uh, the Sheffield community who have been involved in uh, asylum matters for some considerable time. The first one I'd like to introduce is Indigit. Indigit Singh Bogal is a leading theologian and Methodist minister. He is founder and president of the City of Sanctuary and a former president of the Methodist Conference and former leader and chief executive of the Corrymeela community in Northern Ireland. Indigit was born into a Sikh family in Nairobi and came with them to the UK in 1964. Uh, he's lived in Sheffield where he's worked with in multi-faith inner city contexts and he established a Christian Muslim uh, group out of which grew the Sheffield Interfaith Group. He's also organized Christian Muslim peace walks in the city and he helped to start Sheffield's Homeless and Rootless at Christmas, the Hark Project. Next, we have Victor Mujakachi. Victor is an asylum seeker living and volunteering in Sheffield, originally from Harare in Zimbabwe. He's been team leader of the Assist Night Shelter for some time. And Victor was detained last year at Morton Hall, which resulted in a petition for his release signed by over 70,000 people. And lastly, but not least, we have Richard Chesham. Richard was one of the founding members of ASSIST in 2003 and is currently joint chair. He's also a trustee of the Sheffield Conversation Club um, in which he's been active since 2002. A candidate for the Methodist ministry in his youth and later a parliamentary candidate, he has spent much of his life in anti-racist activity. Now we have an hour today to do what we need to do and so I don't want to hang about too much. Um, what I would like to do is just tell people that we can take questions today in the chat or in the uh, Q&A section. Um, so please, if you have any questions that you would like to address to the panelists, put them in there. Uh, we have a couple of moderators who will be keeping an eye on things. And obviously myself, I, I will be putting those to the panelists towards the end, or at least some of them, towards the end of uh, the event. So to kick off, what I'd like to do is really give our first question, and I'd like to direct this one at Indigit, if that's okay. And it's, what was life like for asylum seekers and refugees in Sheffield prior to lockdown, Indigit? That's a very important question. Thank you, uh, Nigel, and it's a, a pleasure to share in this conversation. Can I begin by saying thank you to Migra Migration Matters for this very creative contribution to Refugee Week, and also for all the support that provides for refugees and people seeking 
sanctuary among us. And I especially want to say thank you to Sam and all those who work with him uh, in Migration Matters Festival. Uh, I'm a great supporter and I really, really uh, am thankful to them for all they do. Thank you and bless you. Um, regarding your question, <clears throat> um, I think the I've lived in Sheffield since 1987 and I've been aware of work alongside asylum seekers, people seeking sanctuary, refugees uh, for many, many years in the city. Some amazing different organizations. Originally, it was a Northern Refugee uh, Center in Sheffield, which sadly didn't exist anymore. Uh, and, and organizations like Assist, Conversation Club, um, and a host of others who have been doing incredible work in our city for many years uh, to provide support. Um, my kind of contribution in all this was to say, if we work together, we can make a bigger impact in our city. And that's how City of Sanctuary started. I mean, City of Sanctuary really is an umbrella title under which many, many organizations work together um, to support those who are possibly the most marginalized uh, in terms of inequalities in our city. So I think um, before the lockdown, actually, in some senses, though we were exactly where we are now, as far as people seeking sanctuary is concerned, people have been um, on the outside, marginalized, lonely, excluded, looking for welcome and hospitality and safety and shelter. So, you know, it, it was like that. It's always been the case that um, people, if you like, where we are now in coronavirus, it's a universal phenomenon. Uh, trauma caused by the, this COVID thing is um, a global phenomenon. It's no longer just the experience of the most marginalized, this sense of uh, danger and trauma. No one is privileged in this situation. No one is immune. We all now know what it feels like to be separated from those who are most precious to us. Um, the trauma is not new for people seeking sanctuary and refugees and asylum seekers but at least we can all empathize with them as we all share this reality. So Nigel, in some ways, um, where we are, coronavirus now is a, a kind of a double jeopardy, trauma on top of trauma that's already been there. And now there is hurt for people who have already been in situations of harm and danger through war and extreme danger, uh, extreme weather and so on and who already carry with them deep stars of violence um, and, and being on, on the edges of society. So the dangers for many asylum seekers and refugees is that loneliness and destitution um, now is deepened and exacerbated and all the familiar structures and support are removed. And... Uh, <coughs> That's where we've been, that's who we are. And people need friendship and safety and welcome. Thank you, Indigit. Um, Victor, a, a quick word from yourself, about a minute on your views of where uh, refugees and asylum seekers sat before the pandemic in Sheffield. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, well, um, I can also draw from my own experience as an asylum seeker um, uh, and uh, the experience of uh, um, quite a large group of asylum seekers, uh, fellow asylum seekers as well. Um, coming to Sheffield, I not noticed um, a, a a, a, a huge difference in the way that um, um, asylum seekers um, are, are treated. Um, um, this is uh, this uh, when I came here. This was a city that um, 
uh, it uh, quite a large uh, um, uh, uh, community involvement, um, uh, which meant that the community and organizations uh, built up uh, a support group uh, or support groups rather. Um, uh, uh, these support groups um, uh, 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 cobbled up funds, um, resources, um, in order to, to um, uh, uh, build up support bases that would make um, uh, uh, the lives of uh, destitute and homeless asylum seekers uh, uh, bearable. And uh, such support groups um, um, are reflected in organizations like um, um, uh, Assist Sheffield, mm -hmm. uh, City of Sanctuary, and uh, Open Kitchen Social uh, Club, uh, which also provides um, uh, hot meals, um, um, the Archer Project, and um, the Sunday Center, which also took up, uh, on board um, um, uh, members of um, uh, the asylum seeking, asylum seeking group. So that support group um, has been built over, over um, a, a, a period of time. And that has been working perfectly well until the onset of um, uh, COVID-19, where yeah. a new challenges became, uh, became apparent. Can, can I ask you, Victor, please, then, to, to expand on that a little bit? Um, how have um, things changed in Sheffield because of the lockdown? What have you seen that's different now? Well, uh, I can um, give an example of um, uh, the night shelter, which uh, provided um, um, overnight accommodation uh, for destitute and uh, homeless asylum seekers. And um, this uh, 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 form of support uh, was provided uh, through assist um, in conjunction with um, um, a, a, a church group in, uh, in Pittsmore. And um, it was um, run on, uh, on a daily basis for uh, five days a week, Monday to Friday. And um, during the weekends, um, um, uh, through assist, the, again, a, a hosting facilities uh, would be provided for residents of the night shelter. But because the night shelter offered um, a dormitory type of accommodation where people lived together, they were well, slept to, uh, in the same in the same large hall, but uh, on separate uh, with separate, separate bedding of, uh, facilities. This couldn't go on um, because um, of uh, social distancing distancing challenges, and uh, as such, the night shelter had to be closed. So that was uh, the challenge that was created by by uh, the onset of uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Victor. Richard, could I bring you in at this point yes. as yes. somebody who's been in Sheffield and been part of ASSIST for a long time now? What are the significant impacts of the lockdown as far as ASSIST have been concerned? Uh, before, I said, before I answer that, can I just mention that having been involved since 2002, um, my in involvement started through my good friend Mara Davis, who sadly passed away about six years ago now. Um, and we had Conversation Club for Asylum Seekers and Refugees. Um, and we discovered then that people were destitute, people were homeless, and we tried to find out why. And when we realized why this was the case because of the asylum process, uh, we set up ASSIST. We, we, we went about saying that would provide assistance and help. And over the years have been involved in many things as a result of uh, the experiences of asylum seekers before now. Um, doing things that I never dreamt I would do, like visiting detention centres and seeing families and children in Yarswood, um, visiting prisons, uh, especially I remember a prison visit near, near to Heathrow Airport with a former assist client who had, um, in desperation, got work illegally and been sentenced to prison for it. Um, and I've also been in, um, visiting people in psychiatric wards because of the depression and uh, mental health problems that have been caused by long years uh, without leave to remain and in limbo. That's one thing. Um, on the question of how things have changed since the lockdown, um, ASSIST, of course, has been forced to close its offices during the lockdown, 
in the same way that City of Sanctuary has closed the Sanctuary Building. Uh, so it's very difficult to, or it has been very difficult to maintain the same kind of contact that we had before with asylum seekers. Um, we uh, initiated um, a, a system whereby people were contacted by telephone on a regular basis, people who are in our assist houses and, and other clients. Um, we made arrangements for them to come in and collect their money uh, once a month instead of once a week to minimize social contact. Um, and we're trying to set up a, um, a system of electronic cards, electronic payments, but this has um, hit several glitches and problems. And it now the telephone call I had just before this uh, video started was to tell me that it's not likely to be rolled out. It could be rolled out at, at the end of August. We'd hoped that it would be rolled out before now. Um, so we do maintain uh, contact with all our clients through our hardworking staff. But my concern, of course, is that, or all our concerns, is that um, if we're not in actual face-to-face -face contact on a regular basis with people, we may not pick up all of the problems that they have. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all very well listening to what they say over the telephone, but sometimes body language and seeing people actually gives us an insight into how they're coping or, or not coping. Um, so the mental health problems of people in 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 uh, in our in in lockdown is is a concern. We do have other concerns as well. Okay, thank you, Richard. I'd, I'd like to move us on a little bit now to um, consider what the changes uh, are needed so that asylum seekers and refugees um, can be better looked after as we come out into what might be considered the new normal um, from the crisis itself. Um, since you have the, the more overall view, Richard, from um, ASSIST's umbrella uh, situation, um, Perhaps if you could start us off with that, um, I'm, I'm aiming to give each of you about five minutes on that. So feel free to <coughs> explain to some to some extent what you feel uh, needs to happen next. Well, um, I think some of the things that have happened on a temporary basis, it would be good if they were made permanent. We have uh, during this period increased uh, by a small amount the money that we give uh, to our clients. And it would be good if we had the sufficient resources to do that on a permanent basis, uh, because over the years since we first started ASSIST, uh, the value uh, of the actual money we give uh, has become considerably less because we've taken on so many more clients. Um, we were helping nearly 100 a week before the lockdown started. It's gone down to 75 now because we've taken on um, only a few clients. Uh, uh, since the lockdown started, um, and also many of them have got Section 4 support from the Home Office on the basis of COVID-19. Um, so that, uh, the number of people we're helping has actually gone down from about 90 up to 75. Um, what we need to do uh, when uh, the lockdown ends uh, is to consider whether some of the other changes that we've made could be continued. Uh, for example, paying people electronically so that they don't have to come in and collect their money on a regular basis. And if they come in, they come in for advice and help rather than you know, just collecting money. Um, there are lots of things that uh, we've decided recently we need to be more involved in. Um, one of the things that has always concerned us is the, um, the system of detention of asylum seekers and the effect it's had on some of our clients. We're still the only country in Western Europe really that detains people indefinitely, that should stop. And we're involved in an organization um, called These Walls Must Fall, uh, which is an attempt to look for alternatives to the detention system as a whole. Um, we've often campaigned for the right of asylum seekers to work. Uh, we did this in the very early days of ASSIST, and we met a, a, a number of uh, local MPs. And the MPs that we met at the time said it was no use us raising the right of uh, asylum seekers to work because the Home Office Minister at the time, the Home Office Secretary, wouldn't hear of it, wouldn't even think about it. And this, the, the, uh, the, home, the, home, the Home Secretary at the time was John Reid. It was in the period of New Labour. So we've actually had these kind of problems 
through successive governments, although in, in fact we have to say it's got a lot worse in more recent years. Uh, there's the whole question of no recourse to public funds. Um, of course, asylum seekers who are refused um, uh, asylum are, are then evicted and given no, no support at all. We would like that to end, really, because so many of them do eventually get right to stay when they reopen their cases. Um, and in the meantime, you know, they suffer a lot of destitution and uh, rely, on, rely on charities or friends. As I, say, as I said before, some of them have actually got really rather desperate because they, it goes against the grain them doing that. You know, they don't even have welfare states in the countries from which they've come. Uh, so they feel there's a stigma attached to benefit. We have to tell them this is not really the case here, but, um, or it shouldn't be the case. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it does cause a sense of real powerlessness on their part if they can't work and provide for themselves. And I, we, there is a right to work campaign now, which was beginning to get uh, more support. Um, uh, you know, we can get more hope about um, making progress with that. But now, of course, we're, we're anticipating that we're facing the worst economic depression that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. Worse even than the 1930s, so we go back more than 100 years, it's going to be worse than that, the, the depression we're going to suffer. Uh, and the mass unemployment that is going to come in so many countries, including our own, that I would anticipate that that campaign for the right of asylum seekers to work could be quite a bit more difficult. Um, the question of health charges, I mean, there's always been this system where asylum seekers have a right to primary care, but with secondary care, they, if they refuse asylum seekers, they can't get it. Um, and if they do get it, it's only on an emergency basis and then they build for it. Sometimes people have been billed a ridiculous sum of money, tens of thousands of pounds for health care, including Simba, of course, Victor's son. Uh, so we want health charges to be dropped. Um, uh, the whole culture of disbelief, which has plagued the asylum system from the beginning, is something that we feel absolutely has to change. Um, we can understand why the Home Office has to try and determine who are genuine asylum seekers and who are not on the basis of the uh, uh, interviews in the Home Office papers, but very often we feel that the sad truth is that there is a default position of the Home Office, and that is we don't believe you, and, and that's, that really does have to change. So there are a lot of things that we feel want to, we, need, we need to try and campaign to change once this lockdown is finished. Thank you, Richard. Um, Indigit, your thoughts on what needs to change after the uh, COVID COVID. Well, I, I'm grateful to Richard for all that you've just said, Richard. I'll, I'll try not to repeat um, the points you've made uh, eloquently, and thank you for those, and thank you for all you do and for all that assist does. I think, uh, mm -hmm. Nigel, one of the concerns I have currently is um, I think all the organisations that we have in our mind today who support uh, people seeking sanctuary and refugees are facing drastic cutbacks. They are really, really uh, suffering from that. There are um, uh, funding cuts. Um, there are uh, 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 these kind of cuts affecting the whole of the charity sector, um, organizations running out of money. It's a very precarious situation. And within it, um, there's, there's all kinds of issues around staffing, you know, and support that is needed. And I think I want to first of all say to all our um, people who are engaged with the issues, we need to become more sensitive to the fact that th we're, we're working with people um, who are destitute, but to maintain our work, we also need money. And so I want to encourage people to raise funds for organizations who are working alongside uh, people seeking sanctuary and refugees and to, to help us to actually do this very important work. Um, we aren't getting much money from government. We rely on uh, public generosity. So I think the first thing I want to say is uh, please do make donations and that will help us all very much. In terms of donations, one of the things that needs to happen is 
I always think you should start by asking how are the children, um, the, the most vulnerable amongst us, are, are the, at the youngest amongst us. And in terms of education and being at home and so on, we've heard a lot on, on the news recently about people not being able to access education because they don't have laptops and they're needing laptops. Well, people seeking sanctuary, refugees, the children amongst them need laptops. So if you can help to provide some laptops for children so that they can have access to the internet, that would be a really good contribution to make. I think that everything that can be done to develop ways to keep people connected and support it has got to be a good thing and to make sure people who are uh, asylum seekers seeking sanctuary uh, in accommodation, to make sure they have access to, to um, Wi-Fi connection, that's important. So I think City of Sanctuary is kind of now uh, the main point of contact in Sheffield for tenants and property coordination and, and volunteers uh, and, and for health and safety. So it's, it's an important contribution that's being made and um, they, they need help. We need to help organizations like that to survive um, the pandemic, and to come out to make sure that they, they still exist. So it's important to do all we can to help people to make, maintain contact with legal and health matters through remote service delivery and that people have access to pathways to achieving justice and that they have access to guidelines for their rights uh, so that these are not disrupted. Um, as Richard said, it's okay to have phone check-in, that's very important, but you know, we, we, we want to be able to, to meet face-to-face -face people. And, and all those who are listening in, you know, I want to say to you, look at online petitions. There's all kinds of things like um, lift the ban campaign. No, um, I, 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 the, this ludicrous 26p increase in um, what people can have for their weekly allowance. You, you can't buy a half, you know, second class stamp for that. Um, it's just utterly, utterly ridiculous gesture uh, to say uh, this this uh, weekly income can be increased by 26p. So I I think the, these are all important things that need to happen. As a church minister, uh, I want to say to churchy people who might be listening in, you know, churches have considerable resources and uh, networks, and I'd like them to use those to support organizations who are working alongside asylum seekers and refugees um, and to look at how your church, how your organization can be a church of sanctuary. So within all the other things we've said, Nigel, um, all the other priorities, I want to say that refugees, people seeking sanctuary, asylum seekers, they, are, they have an amazing, great spirit of also helping others. Um, they're great survivors. They're great heroes for me. Um, and they're great also at bringing the gifts they um, offer. Um, and and I we should make sure that the contribution that people can make uh, is not denied. I mean, one of my friends in Sheffield here, who came as a refugee from Liberia, he, he's mobilized a choir and, uh, uh, and arranges worship and pastoral support and providing online training and um, on, on mental well-being. And he's a dedicated worker providing incredible support for other refugees from his own experience of being a refugee, from a knowledge of personal trauma Okay, Indigit. Thank you for that. If, if, if I can stop you there. And sympathy. If I can stop you there and move on to Victor, because Victor, you're an example of that. You are somebody who's lived through the previous um, hostile environment um, up until this point and the additional pressures of 
the current crisis and the lockdown. Uh, what are your thoughts about what needs to change? Um, thank you, uh, Nigel. Um, um, there's quite uh, quite a lot that uh, that needs uh, uh, to be changed, and um, um, looking at uh, picking on what um, what uh, the point that uh, Richard has made, um, um, it's um, this the, the, the whole uh, 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 pandemic is uh, actually um, uh, highlighted the desperate the desperate uh, situation that. Um, uh, asylum seekers, um, particularly refused asylum seekers, uh, uh, go through. And um, I feel personally that uh, this whole um, uh, notion of uh, induced, legally induced um, uh, uh, destitution um, should be should be should be challenged. Um, um, I usually give an ex example, the example of uh, countries like a uh, country like uh, Germany, where there is no um, asylum destitution. Yes, they support them, and when a, a, um, a, a refused asylum seeker um, gets to the end of their 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 support, and um, they are no longer allowed to stay in the country. They are not thrown into into destitution as well um, at all. They are given limited support, but um, they, they 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 are not uh, thrown into destitution. And of course, if we have a situation like that in in the United Kingdom, it means uh, um, uh, organizations like Assist would not be uh, around. But that's not to underplay the huge amount of work and support that they've given. To, to, to asylum seekers. There's also um, 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 countries like Uganda in Africa, very many people don't often uh, think that um, Africa also provides support systems to, to, to um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers. In Uganda, and I don't propose that that happens here because it's a totally different scenario. In Uganda, when especially when they were dealing with uh, refugees from uh, from from Sudan, what they would do was to um, bring everybody, register them. Everybody who fled uh, from either the, the Congo, which is, is neighboring to, 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 to Uganda or Sudan, they would register them and give them a small piece of land so that they earn a livelihood. They become masters of their own destiny. I'm not proposing that uh, asylum seekers uh, could be, should be given pieces of land, or, but it's just one form of support that, uh, that countries are um, um, able to provide. And then they register them so that they are eligible for United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee Assistance uh, in that country. And they don't feel so isolated. That's as much support they can they, 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 they can pro provide. But in this country, we have legally induced uh, destitution and uh, desperation, which leads to mental health uh, um, uh, deterioration. It, a, a month ago, um, I got reports from an asylum seeker who took his own life in Glasgow. He couldn't just go on. It, it, it soon after um, the, uh, the country went into lockdown, he was put in a hotel, but uh, um, room. But he, he took his own his own life. So this whole thing about um, a, a, a marginalizing um, uh, asylum seekers and not providing them with um, because they are, they are categorized as uh, groups of people who have no recourse to public funding, it should uh, be reviewed and uh, looked at. Uh, upon in 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 a, in, a, in a totally different way. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That's uh, that's always for me. I, it's very important to get the voice of the people who have been um, subjected to these environments, the hostile environment in this country, and and um, who are impacted so significantly by the lockdown. Um, I want to try and just summarize what we've said over the last 15 minutes or so. And I think there are probably four key elements that 
come out to me, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear you guys um, comment on that. Um, but I think one of the significant ones is this idea of access. We've heard about the difficulties of access to healthcare, access to technology, and therefore to online services, which particularly at the moment and probably going forward are gonna be very important um, to people who are um, refugees or asylum seekers in this country. So that seemed to be a very key issue. Um, but then also this idea of the, how we tackle the hostile environment, because this culture of disbelief that was talked about, um, you know, being the default position, um, and also the, the inability to work, um, which gives that level of um, independence and respect and, you know, um, to the individuals involved. Um, and then of course, uh, the whole point about destitution, um, you know, the, the sensitivity to that and the, the lack of understanding of what that actually means is, I think, quite, um, quite extensive uh, within the population as a whole. Um, you know, we can all probably have had times when we've been um, low on funds and struggling to cope, but that is very different from utter destitution and having no cash, no home, and no real support available. Um, so I, those seem to be the, the key issues that, that arose for me. Have I missed anything there? Do, or do you, would you, anybody like to expand on that? I think Gillings, yes? Yeah, did you, if we start with you? <clears throat> the only thing I would add <coughs> to what you've uh, very helpfully <coughs> summarised is um, in, in terms of destitution, I think what I was saying is within that whole uh, awful situation of destitution, um, people supporting those who are destitute also need um, financial, uh, you know, back up uh, so you know people often say yeah keep up the good work but actually you can only keep up the good work if if you have the money to do it mm. and so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm making a, an appeal also for funding from supporters for organizations mm. who support people in destitution yes I mean that that is clearly going to be an issue as well because you know organizations like assist that Richard is involved in and um, City of Sanctuary cannot continue to provide um, services and support without themselves having the resources, which I guess is, is the fourth element of, yes. of what I was thinking about, um, the resources to actually deliver the support and the aid that they are determined to do. Richard, from your point of view, that must be a key consideration for you guys. It is. <laughs> Um, again, come, when we set up ASSIST, we only helped four or five people each week to begin with because we felt if we tried to help any more, we didn't know where the money was going to come from. And it didn't occur to us but that we would grow into the kind of organisation, the big organisation and complex organisation that we've become. Um, and it's amazed us, really, just the extent to which we have managed to fund things and resources to do our work. Um, of course, many trusts have provided uh, money that is ring fenced for, for the office and administration, all those kind of things. But in order to actually provide money directly to asylum seekers, we do rely on individual donations and churches <laughs> raise money for us, students who organize events and so on. So it's always a concern that yeah. all of these uh, sources of income should continue. Um, and even when we get those sources of income and heave a sigh of relief for a time, the fact is that we could do so much more if we had more resources. You know, there's a limit to what we could do if we had extra resources, so that's always a concern. Thank you. I, I seem to have lost Victor at the moment. Are you there, Victor? Yeah. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult to try and uh, encompass a whole range of um, experiences into a short summary, as I uh, just vaguely tried to do. Um, 
But what are your thoughts on the, the key issues? What If you had to choose a couple of those elements to uh, be the significant response to refugees and asylum seekers, what would you identify there, do you think? In, in terms of what, sorry. Uh, in, t in terms of the, the sort of the summary that I just gave. So, you know, looking at um, the ability to work, access to services, um, the culture of disbelief and the hostile environment. And then obviously one of the most significant ones, the, the whole issue of destitution. Um, I, I, I you also would want to make reference to what um, what um, the current situation is uh, exposed. Um, um, uh, when you look at the uh, National Health Service and what have you, the involvement of um, migrant groups, um, um, the BMAMEs uh, and um, asylum seekers and, and, and refugees. Asylum seekers um, eh, eh, come from different um, parts of the world and uh, from a whole range of uh, uh, backgrounds. And um, eh, eh, they bring in a lot, they would actually get involved in, um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in British society and um, a British economy in a, in a in a very very large and significant way, if they were they would be given the opportunity to to do so, and um, I myself personally, and I'm, I think I'm I'm uh, way beyond now doing uh, um, what I would have been done say some 15 years ago, 17 years ago when when I came back to this country. Um, I'm uh, um, a, a, a banker by, by, by profession and I've wasted 17 years uh, um, of uh, inactivity and not even practicing my, my, my profession. I remember at the night show that um, I used to meet um, a, a quite um, a, a, a lot of a group of guys. One, there was an, a civil engineer and there was a, a time when um, a, 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 a medical doctor from from Libya stayed for about a week at the at, 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 the, at the night shelter, and these are pools of people mm. who could be very 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 useful within society, and they have fled their countries um, because they want security. And what they would want to do, as soon as they get into 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 to, into um, 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 uh, uh, into these societies to make a contribution to practice mm. their, 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 their professions. But because of this culture of disbelief and um, the often said narrative that um, um, migrants are here to uh, drain on the, on the fiscus, we have this current culture of disbelief and uh, people are not, uh, are not taken uh, on board. So there's a waste of resources that are there and uh, for which people could make a contribution and end their living uh, on their own and um, um, uh, end their own dignity and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, respect, uh, and respectability, which sadly doesn't happen at all. And, um, but that has been uh, exposed now um, uh, during this uh, pandemic where the largest group of people, of professionals in the NHS who died were from minority backgrounds. And um, yeah, you can see the amount of involvement that, that, that these groups have had in, in British of, uh, society. And uh, which uh, uh, the, their contribution actually pokes holes, pokes holes into the argument that uh, um, um, migrant communities are a drain on the fiscus. They are actually quite helpful, and this has got to change. Yeah, thank you, Victor. I, I think that's an important point that we often uh, not forget, but we often forget to express is what a pool of talent there is amongst asylum seekers and refugees that the hostile environment 
prevents us from taking advantage of, fr from benefiting from, uh, however you want to phrase that. And I think it's it's a key issue that the hostile environment clouds um, and also the inability to work and the destitution issue uh, makes it very difficult for those um, asylum seekers and refugees in that in those positions to actually be able to make that contribution that they do. It's all the more impressive, therefore, when people like yourself, Victor, find another way of using their talents. So we, we should thank you for that for a start. Um, I want to move on, though, now to, to the next point, which is how do we put this into action? How do we make this change happen? What are the key ways forward um, in terms of actions that all of us can potentially get involved in? Who wants to take that one first? Yeah. Richard, thank you. Yeah, come. Okay, um, Nigel, just uh, clarify that again. On, on, on what? In terms of action, in terms of? In, in terms of how do we get people involved? What's, what are the routes that <clears throat> typically members of the public uh, can take to actually be a part of the solution? with respect to the city of Sanctuary after the pandemic? Yeah, okay, well, I think the, uh, the first thing to say is that get involved, you know, in some of the support uh, groups and agencies. Um, and uh, that's something we can all do, uh, volunteer as supporters, I'm sure Assist and uh, Open Kitchen and City of Sanctuary, all the organizations we're talking about would uh, welcome more support. Uh, for me, first, you know, it, actually the, all of us individually um, can do something. And uh, one of the key things is, is to um, always challenge hostility. You know, if you experience that in the things people say, um, uh, in the way people behave, you should always challenge it. Um, there are three simple things for me. One is always treat everybody as a human being and require that from anybody else. Secondly, be hospitable yourself and require that from other people to be hospitable. Uh, and thirdly, always challenge hatred uh, and hostility. And you challenge hatred and hostility when you challenge inhumanity and in hospitality. Thank you, Indigit. Richard, your thoughts? Uh, well, I was going to say that the one elephant in the room that we haven't been discussing, of course, is racism. Indeed. Um, and I think that what Indigit has just said, uh, it, it's become even more relevant uh, now that we have uh, the, inc the increase in awareness that's being caused by what's happened in, in the United States and also hidden what's been happening here um, and the Black Lives Matter um, movement um, is raising lots of serious questions. Um, I don't know whether people saw um, a BBC Pro 2 programme recently about Windrush um, and about the way in which uh, immigrants were viewed after the Second World War until now, but it was clear that going through all the old files that there has always been an obsession at the highest level um, in, our, in our government, in our institutions, with trying to prevent too many people of colour, black people, from coming into the country. Um, and it's all there. You know, Winston Churchill, unfortunately, was absolutely obsessed with trying to stop mm. many black people coming into the country. And it's all very well documented in these old files. He was always raising it in cabinet. You know, what can we do to to stop this happening and how can we disguise the fact that we're doing this? Um, and unfortunately, I mean, we think of the 1945 Labour government as a, as a beacon of light creating the NHS and all that, but even Clement Attlee himself, the leader of that government, was actually concerned that too many black people coming in could cause problems and we, we have to learn how to limit the numbers. Um, so, you know, it's all, there's a current of racism that has always been running through our society um, in large part, you know, the legacy of colonialism and the attitudes that that engendered, 
Um, and that is still with us, um, you know, sometimes hidden. And I think that one of the things that we had in mind when we set up ASSIST in 2003 was that it was a combination of two things. It was destitution, but it was also racism. Mm -hmm. And the, the combination of those two is a really toxic mix. Mm -hmm. You know, we had in mind that would, would, would asylum seekers really be treated in this fashion if most of them were white? Mm -hmm. That was Indeed. something that was uppermost in our minds. And I think, um, although things may have improved a bit over the years from the days of Enoch Powell and Rivers of Blood, there is still a serious issue about this. And I think one of the things that we could do um, is in some ways link up with black uh, movements like uh, Black Lives Matter and raise awareness um, mm. about how racism pollutes the atmosphere in our country. I and was actually going to, to comment on that as, as yes. part of the, the roundup is one of the things for me is how do the organizations currently working in Sheffield begin to interact and begin to cooperate uh, with other organizations that are perhaps a more national approach to things such as Black Lives Matter, which is even a global um, situation now. Victor, wh what are your thoughts on um, how we move forward in that way? How do we get people involved? Do we need to get them involved in the bigger campaigns to be able to get involved in the local campaigns? Well, I, I, I suppose it's both, really. I'm, I'm, I'm glad um, um, Richard has um, raised the issue of uh, racism, mm -hmm. um, to which I'm no stranger. Um, um, uh, you mentioned about uh, Churchill, and um, uh, uh, I'm sure you have also mentioned uh, Cecil John Rhodes. Um, um, who, you know Cecil John Rhodes, um, yeah, um, uh, used to be named uh, his name. Uh, well, he, he used to be named after my country, Zimbabwe, until 40, 40 years ago. And um, um, uh, both Churchill and um, and uh, Cecil John Rhodes uh, were white uh, uh, supremacists. Uh, it's all documented. I've read. Um, I've. Um, uh, read articles and books um, about them, um, uh, the way they um, uh, advanced uh, the su superiority of uh, of uh, of uh, the white white race, and that has been generations ago, well before I was born, and this thing has been um, um, endemic, or a pandemic really, and it's been d deeply ingrained in in in, in society, so. Um, I, I'm really pleased that, um, uh, although it's sad, it's sad that it had, um, um, it has taken um, a, a, a George Floyd to die in order that for that to be to be to be highlighted, and um, die in in such a way where he was his knee was placed for uh, nearly nine minutes. Uh, for everybody to start waking up and uh, realize that uh, this has been going on for for a very long time. So the real thing is education, and uh, uh, and uh, the one thing that really pleases me with uh, what is happening now it's um, uh, the campaigns are not only involving black people; they are, are, are involving black and white who are revolted and who believe that. Um, this is, is not in keeping with the values that um, uh, the 21st century century values. And um, one of the things that um, uh, Assist as an organization did when it got started was to involve asylum seekers to take part in activities, in administration, in volunteering, and what have you. And um, if this could be reflected on a national uh, level so much the better. They've started uh, as small steps. And this is why I'm team leader of the night shelter and uh, possibly the only one, or well, there have been other black team leaders of, uh, of the night shelter. So steps are taking place towards that, but it's going to be a long way to sort of uh, conscientize the whole public and what have you, because uh, uh, racism has been there for a very, very long time. It's affected countries like Australia, 
it's affected Africa. It's, it's deeply ingrained in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the United States, but these things have come to fall. And I'm glad uh, people from all uh, persuasions and all races are taking up, uh, uh, joining these campaigns to advocate for change. Thank you, Victor, I appreciate that. Um, we are coming very quickly towards the end of our hour. Um, there are a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, one is a very practical one. Uh, what are people previously using the assist night shelter now doing for somewhere to sleep? That's from Kevin O'Grady. Um, Richard, are you able to comment on that? Victor knows as much as I do, but he's a team leader in the night shelter, but um, my understanding is that um, uh, local authorities now, temporarily, have been given the task of housing all people with no access to public funds as long as, long as this academic goes okay. This COVID-19 crisis continues, but in fact, th th that temporary arrangement is coming to an end, and there is a concern uh, that uh, many councils will now decide to stop the arrangement. Um, I'm, I've been told a few minutes ago that um, Sheffield City Council is still not thinking of stopping it, mm. and they are being very cooperative, but many councils all over the country are now uh, interpreting the government uh, advice as to mean that they should stop providing this kind of accommodation. Um, I think we've got one person um, staying with a host only because it's very difficult to place people with hosts during COVID-19 when people mm. are isolating. Uh, but uh, the, in the main, it's been this temporary arrangement with local authorities that has helped us house um, uh, asylum seekers or see, see to the fact that they are housed. The real okay. question is what will happen when this does come to an end in Sheffield. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, the other question is a little bit more general, and as uh, Lisa Markham, who placed it, uh, explains, is, is partly rhetorical. Um, she comments that at a time of emergency, some voices and experiences become even more marginalised, as to a certain extent we, we have discussed, and she comments that there are no women on this panel. Now, I know Lindsay, who mm -hmm. organises this, uh, these events and I know she will have tried very hard to have got a woman on the panel um, but she comments that she would have been glad to hear about women's specific experiences and the additional and different traumas that women asylum seekers experience. Um, I know that there is a significant amount of this uh, concern expressed. I know that um, a sister been to the council chamber on more than one occasion um, pressing for changes to the uh, Bed and breakfast arrangements because some of those are some of those hostels are not as um, safe as they might be as far as uh, residents there are concerned, and clearly, you know there are issues uh, that women will suffer more than uh, men, particularly with their role in childcare. Um, it's not something we can particularly tackle at the moment, but. Is that something that's on the um, horizon, on the uh, map, as far as uh, City of Sanctuary is concerned? Indigit, your thoughts on that? Um, I was conscious that uh, we were all blokes on this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I, you know, I recognize that. And I think we need to listen to all voices, um, uh, men and women, and all the shades of the colors of the skin that we represent. Um, you, you know, because it's a matter of justice actually, uh, in the end about including everyone. I'm grateful to Richard for talking about racism. I think it's important for um, white people to tackle head on mm -hmm. the issue of racism rather than leave it to uh, black and minority ethnic people. Um, now, I think in terms of sexism, men, men have to really look at our own attitudes. You know, it's a men's problem, sexism, rather than women's problem. It's men who marginalise women. So racism, I think white people have to take uh, much more responsibility to tackle racism. In terms of sexism, I think, Yes, there are only men on the panel, and I, I'm not 
sanctioning that. Uh, uh, you know, we want more representation, but really, um, men have to look at their behavior in terms of um, um, the, the, the well-being of women in the world. Thank you, Interjit. Uh, a useful place, I think, therefore, to finish. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists today, Indigit, Richard, Victor, I think a very valuable contribution and hopefully one that people will be able to take away with them um, for the future. Uh, in, particularly in terms of some of those calls to action, getting involved with the local communities, etc. Um, I would like also therefore to thank uh, Sam, Tom, and Howell, who have been providing the technological background for all this, and in particular, Lindsay McClellan, who uh, on behalf of ASSIST has arranged uh, this event, having unfortunately had to uh, draw it online from what was planned as a, uh, an actual event in real life. <laughs> but I think hopefully we've done uh, a good job. And thank you to everybody who's been participating uh, either as an attendee, and again, my sincere thanks to the panelists. At which point, I shall simply say. Can I just say? Can I just say thank you to you, Nigel, for, for chairing it fantastically today, and um, obviously all the speakers, um, uh, and uh, just yeah, the the team that have organised it. Um, also making note of Festival of Debate, which was originally part of, but we were very lucky to be able to combine it with Migration Matters Festival as well, which I think was very fortuitous. So thank you very much and uh, thanks very My much. My pleasure. Everybody. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you everybody for taking part. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for joining us for this Migration Matters Festival online event. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to make a donation, please visit migrationmattersfestival.co.uk forward slash donate. Your donation will make a difference. Thank you.